Well, welcome back from lunch. Hope you enjoyed the uh, the meal. We've had some wonderful food, haven't we? Yeah, amen. Throughout the uh, conference. And uh, with the beginning of our study here, we have completed our first day's material uh, already. So now we're starting our second day material. So uh, that ought to be interesting to see how that works out. But uh, it's all good. It's a good investment of, of time, a good investment of, of energy to look at these, these wonderful truths that we're seeing. So we're talking about eternal security. And I am so glad and I appreciate so much the way that it's titled God's Eternal Care of the Believer in Jesus Christ. It's a very important topic, very important subject, and it's a part of the uh, continuing idea in the discussion of the confusion that exists sometimes in the understanding of the gospel, the understanding of eternal life, and the things related to that. Because many times there are those who will believe that we're saved by grace through faith, and uh, there's, it's the gift of God, but become very confused when we come to the issue of eternal life. And so it is rightly called God's eternal care of the believer in Jesus Christ because eternal security is God's work on behalf of the believer. It is the work of the Lord. We looked previously a little while ago in Revelation chapter 7, verse 10, where we see that it is salvation that belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The eternal security of the believer is the work of God. If we ask ourselves, how is it that we came to have eternal life? We'd have to say we have eternal life because we have believed on Jesus Christ. It is God's work on our behalf. The same thing is true about eternal security. Once we receive eternal life, are we forever secure in that new life that we have in Jesus Christ? It is something that is secure because it is God's eternal care for the believer. Eternal security is God's work on behalf of the believer. It is through His grace alone uh, that we have seen that we have eternal life. It is through His grace alone that God preserves and ensures the full and complete salvation of each individual, totally apart from any personal merit or human effort. I know you're familiar, you know it by, by heart, you know it by memory, but please look in, in Ephesians, the second chapter, because these words can never be emphasized too much, too often. You think about the, the book of Romans when Paul says he was eager and come to, to preach the gospel to the believers in Rome. Why did Paul need to preach the gospel to believers in Rome? It is because that gospel message, the message of who Jesus is and what he did, the message of his death, burial, and resurrection for us that is necessary to believe in, in, in order to have eternal life is also the same message necessary to have the security of our salvation and to have the sanctification process properly understood. We are, we are saved on the basis of who he is and what he's done. And we continue in sanctification, the progressive working out of that salvation we receive because of who he is and what he's done. And so our eternal security is absolutely the work of God in his grace alone. It is the ensuring of God, the preserving of God, the full and complete salvation of each individual. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are saved by grace. Sometimes the definition of grace gets lost on people. I believe one of the reasons that people have such a struggle with the eternal security, believing that they can never at any time lose their salvation is because they haven't understood fully the grace of God. The grace of God that we have comes to us not on the basis of anything we could ever deserve. It is by grace, Ephesians 2 says, through faith. Uh, the Catholic Church would say you're saved by grace. You have the grace to do the works that you need to do, and that's how, you know, you're saved. But it is by grace through faith. And it's not something of yourself. This salvation 
is by grace through faith, and not something of yourselves, because it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Eternal security is fully and only the work of God. Otherwise, it would be never secure. And we would never have that assurance, and that security of our eternal salvation if it wasn't fully the work of God, the gift of God. If it is the gift of God, we can be sure that God never rescinds the gift. Once the gift is given, the gift is received, God doesn't come one day knocking on the door and say, hey, you know, you're really not what I anticipated, so I sure sort of like that back. We don't understand grace. Grace says we don't incur a debt. That's one of the amazing things about grace. It never incurs a debt. So there's no possibility of having to forfeit the gift. If it's given to us, paid by Jesus Christ alone, given to us freely and, and clearly without cost to us, it is never incurring a debt for us to have to worry about we wouldn't be able to pay back. God, God does not take back the gift that he gives, the gift of eternal life. So since salvation is God's work, the believer can never be lost or in danger of damnation. It is God's work, and God's work never fails. So we have no danger of ever losing our salvation. Look over in John chapter 10. This is a good picture of just absolutely how secure that salvation is. John chapter 10, look in verse 28. John 10, 28. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. That's how secure we are. How secure is that? We're as secure as the power of the Father. He gives them eternal life, and they shall never perish. He gives them eternal life. All that believe on Him, He gives them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. To have that assurance is based on not my ability or my continuation in, in something that I might imagine will be necessary for the assurance and the security of eternal life, but is on the, the basis of the Father. He has given it to me because I have believed on His Son, Jesus Christ, he gives it to me and is kept in his hand. I am in the hand of the Father, and no one can snatch me out of the Father's hand. Well, some may say, yeah, but maybe uh, you can give it back. You can tell God, God, I'm, I'm done with this. Your gift is returned. That's not the poss not possibility either. He says, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. There's no way we can perish, but you can't give the gift back. The gift is not some static entity. Here is, here is this, I give it to you, you've got this. Eternal life is the very life of God. It's God's kind of life. It is that life given to us in new birth. November the 8th, 1951. I'm sure you all have that date circled on your history calendars. The day of uh, uh, that uh, date, the earth didn't shift on its axis, but it was pretty important to me. That's the day I was born. I was born into the family of Willie and Sally Pressler. And no matter what transpired after that day of birth, I was never going to be unborn. I was never going to return to the mother's womb and get beyond the, the moment of conception. I would never be unborn. No matter what happened to me, no what anybody did to me, that was going to be a fact forever settled. When we receive eternal life, we're receiving God's gift of life, God's kind of life, eternal life. We are born again, the Bible says. We are regenerated by the work of the Holy Spirit on the basis of our believing the record that God gives of His Son, Jesus Christ. We will never be unborn from God's family. That is as impossible as you being unborn from your physical family. So salvation is God's work. He completed it. The believer can never be lost or in danger of damnation. Look over in Romans, the 8th chapter. Romans chapter 8. There's a lot of work we're going to do about this later on, and I'm eagerly looking forward to it because Romans chapter 8 is a fantastic chapter. And in Romans chapter 8, in verse 29, 
It tells us that whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. We have here God's predetermining of something. And when God predetermines something, it, is, cannot, it cannot be altered. Well, he is predetermined, began in his foreknowledge, and it ends up in our glorification. Now, that's an unbreakable golden chain. We who have believed on Jesus Christ have been predetermined by, by God to be conformed to the image of His Son. And those He has predestined, He called, and He justified, and He glorified. But if you'll notice, there's something missing in that. It's not predetermined, that's sanctification. That is something that we are progressively developing in. But the other is predetermined. That is going to occur. My glorification is going to occur because it depends not on me, it depends on God's promise. And God's promise can never fail. So God's gracious protection keeps the believer in Jesus Christ safe and secure forever and ever. Philippians chapter 1, please. Philippians, the first chapter. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus. God's work is never incomplete. Now, there are many things that I may begin that I don't get around to finishing. That's been known to happen a time or two on occasion. But God has no such problem with incompletion in anything that He does. All that God has determined, all that God has set out to do, He will do. And he will accomplish that which is completed. And what he has begun in us, the work of salvation, we see it past tense, we're saved from the penalty of sin. Present tense, God is working with us in the Holy Spirit and dwelling us to save us from the power of sin. And one day he will save us from the very presence of sin. And that will be something that will be accomplished. God will complete that work. We will arrive at that glorification. That is a security, a matter that is beyond question. Because God has determined that. God's gracious protection keeps the believer in that regard. Look over in Hebrews, the 13th chapter. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, look in the 5th verse, please. He said, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, in this verse, God doesn't say... If you let your conduct be without covetousness, and if you are content with such things you have, then I will never leave you or forsake you. And he said, no, I will never leave you or forsake you. On that basis, our sanctification springs. And so it is God's gracious protection of us that makes the believer in Jesus Christ safe and secure forever. And it is the motivation for our are living godly lives. We are safe and secure. God has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he doesn't have any caveats to it. He doesn't say, as long as. He just says, no, I will never leave you, nor will, will I forsake you. Now, there are many people who do not believe in the doctrine of eternal security. There are many ministries that don't teach it. There are those who teach that you can lose your salvation, that you're never eternally secure in Jesus Christ. There are those who teach, in fact, you may live your entire life and think you're saved, but you don't die in faith, and so therefore you proved you never had eternal life. You're never really secure. You never really have the assurance. Well, what happens in that case? What happens if you do not believe or you do not teach eternal security? Now, first of all, we see this. If you do not believe and teach eternal security, you remove the good news from the gospel. How can you honestly offer the message of eternal life if you do not believe it is truly eternal? If eternal life isn't eternal life, meaning that it's eternally secure, then God needs to rename it. It's some other kind of life than eternal life. It's probationary life. It's temporary, we'll see how it works out kind of life. Let's give it a try and give it a shot. See how it turns out kind of life. No, it's, it's eternal life. In the book of Hebrews, where we were in just a moment ago, look over in the seventh chapter now. Hebrews chapter 7. 
Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, functions now before the Father as our advocate. He is our high priest before the Father. And he has a priesthood that is an unchangeable priesthood, verse 24. Unlike the earthly Levitical priesthood, the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ is unchangeable. He doesn't have to operate under the limitations of that priesthood. And because he is unchangeable, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Again, it's notice it is God's eternal care for the believer in Jesus Christ. The basis of our being saved to the uttermost is because he always lives to make intercession for us. It's not the basis of what we might do or promise. It is the basis of God's eternal care for us. If you do not believe and you do not teach eternal security, you bring confusion to the teaching of God's grace. You trade biblical grace for some work or some effort by a sinner to secure his salvation. We've seen several times in Romans 11:6. It's either grace or works. It's not a combination. It's either grace or works. Works will never be uh, adequate because works will not be uh, sufficient. God's grace alone is sufficient. And so if we do not teach, we do not understand, we do not believe eternal security, then we are trading God's biblical grace for some type of work or effort by a sinner to secure his salvation, to make it secure. And that's as foolish as the idea that we could ever be saved in the first place by some type of work. If you do not believe and teach eternal security, you destroy hope. Your hearers will never know for certain they're saved, even though God has declared salvation through Christ with absolute certainty. Look over in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the first chapter. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, speaking of how the, 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 what will be the, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and what they're going to name him. He uh, says this in Matthew 1, 21, And she shall bring forth a son... And you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You shall call his name literally Savior, for that's exactly who he is and exactly what he shall do. He shall save his people from their sins. That's the hope that was part of the announcement of the very birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and the very reason he's named as he is named in the scriptures. Look over in the book of First Peter. The first, first Peter in the first chapter, First Peter chapter 1. If we do not believe and teach eternal security, we destroy hope. No one will ever know for certain they are saved, even though God has declared salvation to Christ with absolute certainty. It is important that you and I, as we teach, are clear as we can possibly be on the gospel message. And a part of that is the fact that we are eternally secure and the salvation that God offers freely to those who will believe on Him, on Jesus Christ for it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now notice carefully here, this is a living hope that is given to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the resurrection especially is important here because it is the, the sign that God the Father accepted the, the payment of the Son. It is the sign of the, the final victory. The, 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 everything has been accomplished. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we are begotten to a living hope, to an inheritance described how. Well, maybe we'll make it, maybe we won't. Maybe yes, maybe no. No, incorruptible, undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. For who, verse five, who are kept by the power of God. And what is the basis for this? 
It is through faith and salvation, faith for salvation, through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We have been born again to a living hope. And this living hope is kept for us by the very power of God. The only way we could be in jeopardy of having our eternal security taken away or our, our salvation not be eternally secure is that there was a power greater than God. None exists. And on the basis of this, he says in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. As these believers are going through various trials, Peter tells him, look, you remember this, even as you go through these various trials, you can rejoice in this matter of the fact that you've been born again to a living hope that is incorruptible, undefiled, and does not fade away, and it's reserved for you, kept by the very power of God. And whatever may be the trial we face, that's the hope we have that is never in jeopardy. That's the eternal security of the believer. And if we do not teach eternal security, we destroy that very hope. If you do not believe and do not teach eternal security, then you must deny or you must change certain direct statements from Scripture that clearly teach eternal security. And we're going to see a lot about this later on, so we won't take time now to go through those verses. But as we go through the verses, pay careful attention because this is not my opinion nor your opinion or somebody else's opinion. Those don't matter. This is the Word of God that tells us this truth about our salvation being secure. Some people are so afraid of teaching eternal security because they're afraid the believers are going to live just any way they please then. You're eternally secure. You can't lose your salvation. What's your motivation for serving the Lord? Now go through the scriptures as we'll go through them later, and you'll see that eternal security is never in jeopardy. It's never in threat. You cannot motivate believers to godly living by threatening what God so graciously gives without cost. You cannot motivate believers to godly living by changing the gospel message. You cannot require for the gospel message something that God never requires, even in your most sincere efforts to motivate Christians to godly living. Do Christians sometimes live in ways that must grieve our Heavenly Father? We all do sometimes, don't we? But that doesn't change the message of the truth of God's Word. If we change the message of God's Word, we deny and change the clear statements of Scriptures. Additionally to that, if you do not believe and teach eternal security, you remove the basis for genuine spiritual growth. Assurance causes spiritual growth. Look over in the book of Colossians. Colossians, the second chapter. Colossians chapter 2. Look in verse 2. Let's start in verse 1 to get to the context, the flow of it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. The assurance is the springboard for spiritual growth. Assurance is the bedrock. Assurance is the fertile ground from which our spiritual growth comes from. Look over in the book of Philippians in the first chapter. Philippians, the first chapter. And look over in uh, verse 3. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul is rejoicing in the fellowship of the gospel that he and these believers have enjoyed together. And he says in verse 6 that he is confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete until the day of Christ Jesus. And he says, it's right for me to think this of you all, I have in my heart, inasmuch as both of my chains and offense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of me with grace. If we do not understand that we are partakers of grace, then we're never going to learn to grow in grace. If we always find ourselves in jeopardy because of doubts and fears regarding our salvation, we're not going to understand what it means to be partakers of grace. Paul says these believers were partakers of grace along with him. We are partakers of grace along with Paul and these believers right here. And in that partaking of grace, 
we have this full assurance of God's love for us. And from that assurance comes the, the growth of spiritual maturity. Now look over the book of Colossians again, this time in the first chapter, again in verse 3. And Paul writes to these believers and he tells them this, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. It's real familiar to Philippians chapter 1. And then he says this, He heard of their faith in Christ Jesus and their love for all the saints. What was the basis for their love of Christ Jesus and their, their faith in Christ Jesus and love for all the saints? Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word, the truth, the gospel. I believe there is a causal effect from verse 5 for what we see in verse 4. These believers, because of their hope that was laid for them in heaven, had this great faith they were growing in, in Christ Jesus, and they had this love for, for all the saints. It was on the basis of the assurance of their salvation that they had this fertile ground for spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. Look over in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, please. The 15th chapter. The number of times we've turned to Corinthians chapter 15 gives you a little bit of idea of the importance of that one chapter, doesn't it? And that one letter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse 19 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Our hope extends beyond this life. And it is assured because the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as Christ was raised from the dead, we should be raised from the dead. And there's no condition that being raised from the dead except that we have believed on him who was raised from the dead. We've trusted him for eternal life. If you do not believe and you do not teach eternal security, you will emphasize the fear of hell rather than the love of Christ as the motivation for living the Christian life. The Bible teaches that the love of Christ should be that which motivates us. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. It says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. The fear of hell, rather than the love of Christ as a motivation for Christian living, is a poor substitute. It is incorrect. It is inaccurate. We no longer have that fear. We've been delivered from that fear. It no longer has that chain and that bondage in our life. We've been delivered from fear, delivered into the love of Jesus Christ, love of God in Jesus Christ. And that love of Christ motivates us. That love of Christ constrains us. That love of Christ is what propels us forward in our Christian life. If you do not believe and you do not teach eternal security, you're going to lose confidence. You're going to lose hope and confidence in your future participation in the rapture. If you are not sure that you are eternally secure, why would you look forward to the rapture? If a believer can lose a salvation, how can God call the rapture the blessed hope of every believer? And we're told it is the blessed hope of believers, every believer. And we're to comfort one another with the truth of that. Look over in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Unfortunately, about the only time we hear any teaching, any consistent teaching on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, these verses we're looking at 13 through 17, is at a funeral. And they are especially important at a funeral, but my, my, please, there's, these verses are, are for us daily to know this truth right here. It is the blessed hope of every believer that the Lord Jesus Christ unless we die before his coming, will come and receive us unto himself. And if we've died before his coming, he will raise us to be with him. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive remain to the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds, with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then the next verse says, because of that, comfort one another with these words. But you lose that hope and confidence in your future participation or rapture if you do not believe in eternal security, if you do not teach it to others and you rob them of that hope and that confidence. A very important matter. The message is very important because the truth of the message is a real uh, source of assurance. It's the source of spiritual growth. It's the, it's the fertilizer that, that produces within us that spiritual maturity that our Lord our God is looking for. So, what's the real question? The real question is, can a child of God lose his salvation? Remember the answer to this. The answer to that question, can the child of God lose his salvation? That answer must come exclusively from the pages of the Word of God and not from feelings, not opinions, not experience, not denominations, not dogma, nor from tradition. What is the truth is the thing that matters. You know, it doesn't even matter what I say the Bible says. It only matters what the Bible says. That's why it's important for you to know the scriptures. When I was uh, graduating from high school, getting ready to go to college, I've been raised in, a, in the Baptist denomination, so everybody thought I would go to a Baptist college. I, they knew that I wanted to go into ministry in some way, some form. And this is not disparaging to the, to the Baptists because I, you know, I, I love them. I'm a recovering Baptist myself. But, um, and so it was assumed I would go to uh, a Baptist school and then later on a seminary. And when I told them I wanted to go to Bible college, they thought, what in the world? You want to go to Bible college? And they said, why do you want to go to Bible college? And I said, well, I want to go there instead of a Baptist college because I already know how to be a Baptist. Now we'll know the Bible. And so that's the important thing, isn't it? That we know the Bible and then that we can teach it clearly to others especially when it comes to this matter. So it's not your opinion, it's not my opinion, it's not what we've experienced, our denominations or our traditions. We become so clinging to those traditions and our experiences that we forget that the final authority is the Word of God. We have to know that authority. So does it really matter? What does it really matter what we think or believe on the subject of eternal security? It does really matter. It matters, first of all, because... As a person thinks in the heart, so is he, according to Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. It doesn't mean that you are everything you think you are. You might think you're all that in a bag of chips. It doesn't mean you are. But you are as you think. And if you think incorrectly, then you will have incorrect patterns in your life. I really believe that all the action of life comes from a belief system. I make decisions based on what I believe to be true. If I believe it to be true that I'm eternally secure in Jesus Christ, I'm going to have the assurance, I'm going to have the security that I need to fully invest myself without fear in the knowledge of God's Word and to be able to instruct others in the knowledge of God's Word so that we can grow in the Scriptures to the glory of God rather than to the appeasement of my fear and my insecurity. And so it matters a great deal, because as a man thinks his heart, so is he. Yes, it does matter. It matters because if you believe you can lose your salvation, you'll live in fear and doubt, and you will never glorify God in your life filled with fear and doubt, because you'll always be, in some measure, limited, if not completely paralyzed, by fear and doubt. Fear and doubt rob us of so much. They bring us to the place of despair, eventually. When believers live in fear and doubt and get to the point of despair, they make choices. They either decide, this just doesn't work. This is, this is not for me. I'm out of here. Or they just learn to play the game of the Christian life. They learn how to say the right words, do the right things, be in the right places, be associated with the right people. But they're never filled with the fullness of the grace of God to know the love of God in all its fullness so that they are able to serve and please Him 
and to grow into spiritual maturity in the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells us, secure forever in their salvation. Otherwise, we're filled with fear and doubt, and we cannot glorify God in that matter. So yes, it, it matters, because if you know from the Scripture that you cannot lose your salvation, you will live rejoicing with thankful confidence and certainty while giving all glory to our gracious God. If I perform the things in my life, if I live in my life, if I do the things in my life that I, I do as a believer, in order that I can somehow or another assure myself that I am still in good relationship with God, I'm still secure in my eternal life, then God doesn't get glory from that. I get glory from that. I'm doing good enough. I'm doing better. I'm doing, it becomes me and me and me. It becomes all man-centered. And the focus is all for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all for God the Father. And that glory that I bring to myself robs God. And God says he will not share his glory with another. And God cannot be pleased with me. He can't bless me. He can't reward me. He can't give me the fullness of all the things he wants to give me in the Christian life if I'm living my life in order to secure my salvation so that I don't lose it. I need to be free from that kind of fear, free from that kind of doubt and worry so that I can glorify God in all ways in regard to the Christian life. So the question, does it make a difference how you respond to the question of other people? Can a Christian lose their salvation? That makes a big difference, doesn't it? Of course, because if you do not believe that, then your response is going to reflect it. So the answer is yes, because your answer tells your true beliefs about salvation. If you believe that salvation can be lost, then by implication, you also believe that salvation is earned or maintained by good works. This era keeps you from ever knowing with certainty that you're saved. Look over in the book of 1 John, the fifth chapter. 1 John, the fifth chapter. I believe one of the greatest problems with either not having a clear gospel message that says it's by grace alone, through faith alone in Jesus Christ, or having that message but not having the eternal security settled in your mind, is that in fact we impugn upon the character of God because God has said that's true. You are saved by faith alone in Christ alone, and you are eternally secure in my love. You're in my grip. We're in the grace of God and the grip of God. Hallelujah, we're in his grace and grip. And so we find in 1 John chapter 5, these words. Verse 11 says, And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has a Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now go up to verse 10 and see what the implications are of not believing that testimony. Verse 10 says, He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made God a liar or accused God of lying because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son and he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. These things are written that you may believe in the name of the Son of God and that by believing His name you will you'll be fairly convinced. You'll be pretty sure. No, you will know that you have eternal life. Why? Because that's God's testimony. That's God's word to you. It's not because, you know, Donnie told us that one day, one Friday, down there in Charlotte. No, it's because God said, this is the testimony of my son. And I've written these things through John here so that you could know that by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and believing on the Son of God, believing on his name, you would have eternal life. You can know that. You know it because God has said it. You know it because it is secure based on God's promise. Not based on my promise, but it's based on 
God's promise. Look over in the book of Titus just real quickly. The book of Titus tells us this, Titus chapter 1. Paul talks about uh, 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 the dressing of who he is and his, uh, his uh, salutation in verse 1. And then he says in verse 2, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. He cannot lie. We are certain we are saved. The error comes when we doubt God or we take the words of men other than the words of God. What a mistake to make. If you do not know from Scripture that salvation can neither be earned nor lost by personal conduct, whether good or bad, then you, then you, know, you cannot understand eternal life is a free gift. If you know it, then you do understand that eternal life is a free gift. So if you know that the Scriptures tell us the things they tell us, then you will know that eternal life is an absolutely free gift. If you know from Scripture that good works do not play any role whatsoever in your salvation, then you've begun to understand God's grace. You've begun to understand God's grace. God's grace is God doing for us what we are totally undeserving of. That is His unmerited favor. In Titus chapter 3, or just a little bit further over in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Christ Jesus our Savior. Christ Jesus our Savior. That's the message. That's the truth from the scriptures. So here's the question. Who or what is the final authority on the subject of eternal security? It's a big topic. And there's debate and argument and papers written about it back and forth, books written about it back and forth. But who is the final authority? It's not the one with the most impressive degrees. It's not the one who can write the most books or the one who can speak the most persuasively. The final authority on the subject of eternal life, it's not my opinion, it's not my own private experience, and it's not my feelings. And it is not my church's creed or dogma. What is the final authority? The final authority is the Word of God. So when it comes to the final authority, being the Word of God, then we need to be like the Bereans. When it comes to the matter of eternal security, we must be like the Bereans. Acts 17.11 Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That's our challenge, to examine the scriptures daily. Sometimes, unfortunately, what we like to do is take the Christian community and take a poll. Well, you know, what's the majority opinion? Or sometimes we like to pick and choose our favorite religious leader our favorite Christian writer, our favorite pastor or teacher, our favorite radio evangelist, and we follow them. And we don't go through a door unless they go through that door first. That's not being noble-minded like the Bereans. Noble-mindedness is to examine the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. First, receiving the word with great eagerness wanting to know the truth. we got to begin there. you got to want to know the truth. Never be afraid of the truth of God. It will never harm you. Know the truth of God. Examine those scriptures daily to see if these things are true. And then having that conviction, we need to share that truth with those who need it so desperately. Let's pray together, please. Our Father in heaven, I'm so grateful for the truth of the security of my eternal life. I'm so grateful, Father. It does not depend upon me. It depends upon your promise, which will never fail. Your truthfulness, which will never be less and completely truthful. It depends upon your power, which is never diminished and never in short supply. It's your work. It's your care for the believer in Jesus Christ. So, Father, we are truly and absolutely 
eternally secure. And there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for that truth. May we live in it and grow mightily in the Spirit of God based on the assurance of our eternal security in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen.